Have you ever been confused by the graphic settings in video game as you don't really know what they do? In this video I'll go through the most common video game graphic settings, what they actually do and how they can impact your gaming experience. Your game can actually go from this to this with actually knowing what happens in between and what causes the lags you always have. And be sure to stay till the end of the video because I will reveal which one of these bottlenecks, your CPU or GPU, as well as which one are the most important to turn on. And before we move on, why should you listen to me? Well, I'm a professional engine programmer specialized in graphics with over a decade of experience in the game development. So I kind of live, eat and breathe graphics programming. The first thing I want to mention in order for everything moving forward to make sense is the difference between CPU and GPU processing as well as their respective storage usage. All graphics related video game settings are taxing in one way or another, yet they affect very different parts of the PC. So just a quick rundown. Heavy CPU processing is for example difficult algorithms and settings like physics, but it could also be culling algorithms such as occlusion culling. Heavy GPU processing is for example ray tracing and ray marching, and settings like screen space reflection and screen space ambient occlusion. Heavy CPU memory is for example level of details, as they impose on having more models swapping throughout runtime. And lastly, heavy GPU memory also known as VRAM, are things that need to stay on the GPU for a longer time. Example is high quality textures and big shadow atlases. So settings like texture quality and shadow quality is a big taxation here. So starting with VSync. VSync plays a significant role in synchronizing frame rates with monitor refresh rate to prevent screen tearing. Anti-aliasing. FXAA, SMAA, SSAA. Anti-aliasing techniques smooth jagged edges in games. Think of it like Minecraft. You can only build with square blocks, but trying to make a round corner with squares is hard. So you will either need to up the area, or in graphics we call this fragments. Or we have some kind of linear interpolation on edges to minimize this. Model and texture rendering. Level of detail, also known as LOD is a way for games to define different quality meshes depending on view distance. The further away something is, the lower resolution and vertex count it can have. And sometimes it can just be rendered as a quad, also known as an imposter. Texture quality and anisotropic filtering. Higher texture quality and anisotropic filtering enhance texture detail and sharpness, primarily impacting GPU performance by increasing VRAM usage, because the texel density of the texture is higher. Therefore, VRAM usage goes up. Anisotropic filtering is just a cool way of sampling texels that are very small to the view, so it doesn't look glitchy. Tessellation. Tessellation adds geometric detail to primitives, such as adding vertices, to make lower quality models look higher quality with more vertices. However, it can impose a substantial workload on the GPU due to increased vertex processing. Post-processing effects. A lot of these implementations are made to mimic lenses and cameras, and doesn't make sense at all if you were to think about it in real life scenarios. Ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion fakes shadows in areas where it's hard for light to reach. This can be done by an ambient occlusion texture or in screen space, also known as SSAO. This is usually a GPU expensive performance, not so much that it affects the VRAM, but it does affect the computational power. This is also often done in a compute shader. Bloom. Bloom is the way lenses get overexposed when there are powerful colors in the image, also called HDR. In games, we either say that a surface is emissive, and therefore I should bloom. Or we can define that anything that goes above a certain threshold will bloom. Just be careful not to overdo this. Depth of field. This also mimics the lens of a camera, where you can set a focal point and everything before that and after that gets linearly blurrier. Motion blur. Turn it off. Lens flare. Okay, I will say what motion blur is. Motion blur. When motions are happening in your view, you get an image with velocity vectors, also known as temporal. We then use this temporal value to blur the current frame, resulting in blurring more if we move around the camera more. Lens flare. 
lens flares are those shiny, glowing effects you sometimes see around bright lights like the sun or lamps. They happen because light bounces around inside a virtual camera lens, creating those streaks or circles, also known as bokeh dots. Usually lens flares doesn't take a lot of processing power too, but it could be done in a both a CPU and a GPU scenario, so it's hard to tell. Shadow quality and screen space reflections. These features primarily impact GPU processing power. But for shadows, VRAM is taking a big hit here because of the huge atlases. Shadow quality usually just softens the shadows and amp up the texel qualities of the shadow map atlas, while screen space reflections usually just go from being actual screen space reflections to having like a cube map reflection and jumping between fake in-betweens. And it could also be like real ray traced. DLSS, XESS and FSR. Or we usually just call these frame upscaling or frame generation steps. Advanced techniques like DLSS utilizes deep learning AI and smart algorithms to upscale lower resolution renders and improving performance without any significant loss in visual quality. If we look at DLSS, it actually used so-called tensor cores or DLSS cores, whilst FSR is just an algorithm that does similar job but without the help of AI. Moving on to global illumination. Global illumination, or GEI for short, are techniques that simulate realistic bounce lighting interaction within a scene. Significantly enhancing visual quality, and this time I'm, I'm saying significantly because it's significant and it's because I love lighting and it's the fucking coolest thing ever. However, global illumination is known for taxing GPU and CPU power because of the huge amount of work needed for it to work. Global illumination settings, when you turn it from low to high, off is probably just only ambient light. Low, which is just image-based lighting. Medium might just be like spherical harmonics. And then high might be ray tracing or cone tracing or path tracing or voxel based global illumination or some kind of newer technique. So which one of these actually tank your performance the most? Well maybe this doesn't come as a surprise but shadows and global illuminations have been and are still one of the biggest bottleneck when it comes to video games performance wise these days. Shadows are just not scalable on how we do them today because we render the scene twice and we need to store huge atlases to actually do something with the data. And the global illumination is just horrible because to achieve global illumination we need to fake ray tracing in some way and that's why it just never scales in a runtime solution. You can do offline global illumination which actually works quite well but it comes with downsides if we have like a wall it will bleed light over to the other side and we cannot really solve this without doing a runtime solution nowadays. But with graphics cards getting better and better we can see that ray tracing solutions on some specific things aren't that bad today. One thing that you might not really think of when you say bad performance is anti-aliasing. And that's if you don't know the tech behind it, you don't know that it's like rendering your scene twice or four times. Instead of rendering 9020 by 1080 pixels, you're rendering that, but then also halving it or doing quarter pixels or doing eight pixels or fragments. And that's just so much more data that is just not scalable at all. And the last thing that actually tanks your performance without people thinking about it, it's actually post-processing effects. Usually when you think of post-processing, you think of only the screen. So screen space ambient occlusion and the screen space reflections, even though they're screen space and post-processing post -processing effect, they're really heavy, really, really heavy because we're ray tracing things. So try to avoid a lot of the post-processing effects and it will actually do a lot of help for you. And for the last question, which I want to answer, which one should you enable if you want the most FPS in your game? Well, the newly added FSR DLSS solutions are really cool when it comes to a game programmer's perspective, because I can see that this is actually what we need AI for. So, although FSR isn't really AI, we can put it in the same category because it's doing almost the same thing, but not on an AI basis as DLSS. If the game supports DLSS or FSR, enable it. The amount of FPS you actually gain is so significant to the amount of little detail you lose in the image. 
And remember, a lot of these settings aren't viable if you don't run the correct graphics API and the game doesn't support it. So if you want to know more about graphics APIs, be sure to subscribe down below and watch this next video which I talk about in-depth graphics APIs.